Hey, good morning. Hey, if you're new, I'd also like to welcome you. I'm Charlie, the lead pastor here. I'm glad that you're here. Um, we're wrapping up a, um, our series on money, and I would like to agree with something that Brandy said earlier. I think I am ready for a break from the break, too. It's been uh, kind of a wild uh, 11 or so days uh, for us. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, my wife, Heidi, and our middle daughter, Lauren, uh, went on a senior trip that uh, my wife's parents paid for, which is really awesome. Uh, they got to go to Italy, and we're in Italy for 10 days. Um, and so me and the seven-year-old, it was just the two of us for a while, and it was, it was awesome. I love her. We used to spending time together, really good friends, and people are asking me, like, how's it going? You feel like you're doing okay? Is, like, is, it, is it more stressful? I was like, the thing is, the kid talks a lot, which, which, is, gr- which is great, which is great, but when there's no one else to absorb the words, it just, it, it was hard, but we had, a, we, had a, we had a great time, and um, I discovered something about myself in those first few days, really. Um, so uh, the first few days, Layla was still in school, and um, I would take her to school like, like normal, but then I realized after that that I'm really addicted to my routines. Like, like I have my routines, and this is so on, on Thursday I do this, and then this, and then this, and then Friday I do this, and then this. I have, the, have these routines that I do, and, and, and being like single dad in charge just really threw me off. Even, even in times when it shouldn't have. Like I said, I, I take her to school on Thursday like I always do, and then for theoretically between then and when I pick her up from school, my day should be the same. It could be if I wanted it to be, but I felt like it couldn't. Like I felt like part of me felt like, well, I have to be home. Why do you have to be? I need to work from home. I need to be from home. Well, because I'm dad and dad has to be home. And it was just, it was just, it was just, it was just weird. It was a weird few days. And like last Sunday, I was trying to keep it together when I was preaching up here. But I, I, I was like, I, I was just telling myself the whole time. I'm sitting here trying to preach to you and telling myself, don't leave Layla at church. 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 Because, I mean, I'm, I, mean I, I don't bring her to church, and I don't take her home from church. But I think there's somebody else that's bringing her here and is in charge of her. Now I am, and it's not part of my routine. Not that I was ever really afraid that I was going to leave her. But just like I, like I said, I realized like, there's something about my routines. So it's got me asking a lot of questions about my routine. Seems a little unhealthy, maybe. Um, are are, are these are these routines that I have? Are are, are they? Are, am I in a groove? Or am I in a rut? And sometimes you don't really know the difference. Like you, you're doing the same thing over and over again. If it's going really well for you, it's a groove. If you're doing the same thing over and over again and it ain't going well, that's a rut. And I just kind of some kind of asking myself this question. So then this is how my brain works, and I go from that to kind of thinking about uh, preaching. And thinking about finances and what we've been talking about over the last few weeks is uh, giving. And we kind of had these three reasons why it's important for us as followers of Christ to be people who are generous givers. First time we talked about that it's, it's just the right thing to do. God commands it, first of all, so he, he, he tells us to do it, he asks us to do it, and it's just the right thing to do. It's the appropriate way to honor God by giving back to him. It's the right thing to do. And then two weeks ago, we talked about how God blesses generosity. Yeah, you need to do this. It's the right thing to do. But if you do it, I'm going to bless you. My hand will be on your life, on your finances, and my blessing will be with you. And then last week, we talked about that God um, uses our, our money to change the world. That it's not just, you know, when we buy something for us, like, hey, I got this one thing, and I'm going to enjoy it for a little while. But when you give... I mean, you're changing the world, and it has rippling effects for, for eternity, really. And God can take this little bit that you have and do incredible things with it all over the world. And so we've been talking about that for a few weeks, and here's the thing that I'm mindful of. That I'm sitting here, and I'm talking, and that there's a significant portion of the audience that's like, yeah, well, that, well, that sounds real good. That just sounds, that sounds nice. But you don't know the situation that we're in. And I would like to suggest that some of the situations that we're in with our finances where we feel like we can't really respond to God in giving the way that He calls us to is because we're in a rut. This is kind of how I do my finances. I get the paycheck and I'm scared and I struggle and I don't know how I'm going to pay all the bills and I try to pay what I can. And if I should have something left over, I may try to give it to God. But 
I, I don't know that I'll be able to, and probably I need to save this up for the next paycheck for this other set of bills because we've got this debt, and we've got this, and we've got this. And this is how finances work. People live paycheck to paycheck because they're in a rut. People don't have enough saved or don't have the ability to give because they're in a rut. This is just kind of how you deal with finances. And when I say this isn't how you deal with finances, well, this isn't how you, sh- how you should deal with them. And I think there are a lot of us that would recognize, man, that I am in a rut with my finances. I, I keep doing the same thing. We're not making any progress. I'm still incredibly anxious and stressed about it. We don't seem to be making any kind of real progress in the things that we want to do. I'm not able to give. I'm in a rut, and I know that I am. And I think there's some of you in a rut you don't know that you are. You're, you keep doing and repeating some of these same habits and principles, and they're not working for you, but you think they are. You think that's how it is. When in reality, God offers us something completely different, and we want to spend some time today just a little bit more practical about maybe ways that we can get out of this rut. And, the, and, and before, even before we get to that practical, I think that there are some big picture questions that we need to ask about our own attitude towards our finances because you can give all the practical advice in, in the world, but if our hearts can't hear it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. And so we're going to look today in Matthew chapter 6. One of the things that we, uh, we talk about every year when we talk about finances is there's a couple reasons why we do this. One, because it's incredibly important. It's a topic that is incredibly important to us. It is, it is, it is the number one cause of anxiety for a lot of us. It's stress in relationships. God, and, and, and honestly, Jesus talked about it a lot. He talked about it a lot because he said it was the number one thing that will compete for your attention with God. And so if it was one of the things that was primarily on the heart and mind of Jesus, it's one of the things that we most struggle with. It's why we talk about it. So we're going to look at kind of a little short little passage um, that Jesus, well, relatively short compared to a sermon. It's actually a pretty long passage compared to what we usually talk about. So I want you to be ready for this. This is actually like 15 or so verses. But I wanted to allow Jesus to kind of have his whole thought. Because when he kind of puts this whole thought out there, I think it's going to help us with some attitude problems that we have that I think that are keeping us from taking the right steps. So we know that we should give, but I have to take these steps to get there, but I can't take these steps to get there because I've got this attitude problem. And so he addresses this with his followers here in Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 19. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And I think we all understand that kind of that little piece. It's kind of the thing that we talked about last week. That, you know, if you give money, I mean, you're storing up treasure in heaven. You're making a difference in this world and in the next world, and you're investing something that will last forever. What he's saying is whatever it is you do with your money here, it's going to ultimately die here. It's going to decay. It's going to get stolen. It's going to be taken away. It, everything here is temporal, so it doesn't make any sense. Like, why would you build up treasure here where it's ultimately going to decay and be gone when you could be building up treasure in heaven and it will last forever? And then and he says, and, and there's an important connection here. You know that your heart needs to be With God, if you put your treasure there, your heart will be there. And he talks about this great connection. I think that's something, again, we've talked about this last week. He continues, verse 22. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now that last little bit there, again, I think is something that we've already talked about. You can't serve two masters. There's this competition in our heart between God being number one and money being number one, and they can't both be number one. Either you're going to use God to kind of, you're going to try to use God to help you get rich, or you're going to use your finances to serve God. You can't have it. You, know, you, can't, you can't do both. But in between these two ideas, there's a really random idea that, that, that Jesus has. It doesn't really seem to fit in. 
He's like, your eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your body will be full of light. It's like, yeah, okay, well, that's great. But what on earth does that have to do with money? Like, if we just took that by itself, we might be like, hey, be, be you know, there's a, there was a song I grew up with, right, when I was a little kid, careful little eye what you see, right? Very scary song that God is up there judging you about what you do. Anyways, <laughs> it's actually a pretty creepy song, but it's, it's kids. I, do we, I hope we don't sing it in front of kids. I need to find out because I just, I just totally just destroyed that song. Um, but, but he's talking about money here. In the, context of, in, in the context of money, what is he saying? So you, you, there's so much that you can see. I see what you have. I see what they have. I see what I don't have. I see all of these things, and I wish that I had. And if I don't discipline what I see and what my heart feels when I see it, then my heart can go to a really dark place. I want that. I need that. Why don't I have it? And then greed comes in and he says, my eye sees, my heart gets dark, and then Jesus says, well, how great is that darkness? But if I can see all of the things I don't have and I can see the people who have more and I discipline my heart based on what I see, then I can, I can, I, I can, I can be okay. And basically what he's saying, what, what, what you see with your eye and how you respond to it is a key to your internal spiritual health. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. I just want to make sure we understand what he's getting at there. Verse 25. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Probably feels like we just need to read verse 34 again. Maybe just call it a day. And we'd just be done early. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Now he's talking to a group of people here that are significantly poorer than most, if not all, of us. The kind of people who are living day to day, who only make enough money in one day to get enough food for them for that day. And they hope that they're going to be able to work tomorrow to get enough money and enough food to eat food on that next day. And so people who are in a significantly worse financial situation than us, he's looking and saying, man, don't, don't, don't worry about it. God's got you. He knows you need those things. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow, tomorrow's, tomorrow's coming. Don't worry about today. Today, today's got plenty of troubles. Tomorrow will take care of itself. You just trust God. You trust God and He knows that you need all these things and He'll take care of you. Now He's saying that to people again who have significantly less than us and the fact that we have significantly more than them doesn't really change the message any. Because one thing I feel like I've discovered the older I get, the more people that I talk to and um, as we've seen the ups and downs of, of our own finances, how much you have does not really is not correlate to the amount of anxiety that you have. And in fact, sometimes the more you have may actually increase the amount of anxiety that you have because the greater the fear is that you're going to lose what you have. And I think no matter where we are, we all kind of struggle with the, the thing, the things, this anxiety. Am I going to have everything that I need? And sometimes I feel like we can't really tell the difference between want and need anyway. And so now we're not really worried about what we need, but we're worried about what we want, and we worry about it with the same level of anxiety as these poor people who really legitimately weren't sure where they were going to eat tomorrow. But the message to them and the message to us is the same. 
Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and, and, and God will take care of this. So what we're going to do is we're going to ask three questions. Three questions that I think that if we just kind of can reorient our mind a little bit will allow us to kind of get on top of a lot of this financial stress that a lot of us are living under. Now the question, I mean, these are three yes-no questions, and the, I mean, you know, the, the church answer to all of them, of course, is yes, but it's really not a question of what the right answer is supposed to be. It, it's what is really true right now in your heart. And for some of us, we have to be honest, and the answer to the question, the answer to the question is going to be no. And we need to spend some time just thinking and praying about well, what would it take to, to get to yes. And the first question is this. Are you willing to trust God with your finances? So right now you have your finances and you feel a lot of pressure associated with them. I have to make sure I do this right. I have to manage this right. I have to do all these things. I have to, I have to be in charge of this. And God says, hey, why don't you just trust me with that? I've got a plan, I've got an idea, I'm God of the universe. Why don't you just trust me with it, and I'll take care of it. Can you do that? Are you willing to trust God with your finances? Now, for some of you, this kind of just sounds like something that preachers say. That's just some kind of church talk. Guys, you just need to trust God with your finances. And if you'll trust God with your finances, then he'll come in and he'll bless you. You're like, oh, great, whatever. You don't understand. But I ask you this. Do you believe that the God of the universe, if you were to trust Him with, yeah, I'm going to manage my finances according to the principles that God has, and I trust then that God will make sure that I'm taken care of. Do you really believe that? Or is that legitimately just something preachers say? Because whether or not you truly believe that, I think is going to be a primary determiner of, of, of your own spiritual health with respect to your finances. I believe that God will take care of me. I believe that if I trust Him with my finances, my family and, and, and I, we're going to be okay. What does He say? Again, verse 33, a very popular verse. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. He will make sure if I seek Him first, He's going to take care of everything. So I'm worried about all these things. And then I try to get God at the very... I'm worried about all these things. Like, God, will you, will you please help me? He says, if you'll just turn that around, I'm going to focus my attention. I've got, apparently, I've got a lot of excess energy. I've got a lot of emotional energy that I'm spending right now worrying about stuff. I'm just going to take all that. I'm just going to take that energy. I'm going to give it to God. I'm going to put him first. And all of these things that I'm worrying about, he says God will take care of them. I'm going to seek him first. Obviously, there's a financial component to this. I get money and I give the first portion of it back to him. That's one of the best ways that we can show God that he legitimately is first. I pay you first. Before I buy something for me, I give back to you what is yours. That is an important financial principle. But it's more than a financial principle. This is talking about your life. In your life, God needs to come first. And if I legitimately live a life where God is first, then He promises that all of these things will be taken care of. And that's one of those things, again, it's easy to believe when things are good. The real test of the answer to this question is when things are not so good. And so it's kind of an annual tradition. Every time we have the finance series, I give you an update on this house that we own that we don't want to own. <laughs> and for those of you who are new and have fortunately been spared the whining um, up until this point, let me just tell you, um, we've lived in Fayetteville now for almost nine years. And um, we own the home that we lived in before we moved here still. We've had renters in it for a lot of the time. We've tried to sell it and been unable to. So we, we've gotten a new realtor. We're hoping to put it back on the market pretty soon. And we kind of said, hey, you know, can you figure out maybe why this house hasn't sold? And in the process of her investigation, um, she discovered uh, for us that the house has foundation problems. 
And not the kind of foundation problems where you're like, you know, oh, we'll just come out there and beep, bop, boop, 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 and everything's fine. It's nothing, nothing, nothing like that. It's the kind of thing that it's, 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 it's crazy expensive to fix. I can tell you the number, but it would, it would it, it just, just to say if I did, it would be, it would, you would be like, oh, no. It's just, it's just big. It's, it's big, it's bad, right? And, 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 and suddenly we're at this point where um, we have to pay a lot of money to fix something we wish that we didn't own. I ask you this question. What does this change about my relationship with God or God's relationship with my finances? What does it change? It doesn't change, it doesn't change anything. It, it, change, it changes nothing. God has still promised that if I seek Him first, He's going to make sure everything's taken care of. That's what he's promised. And again, it's, it's, it's one thing to say that. It's one thing to say it. It's another thing to believe it. It's one thing for me to say it to you right now. Church preacher mode. Right? Guys, no matter what, no matter how big that number is, we still trust God. It's another thing for me to believe it when my, my stupid brain wakes me up an hour before my alarm goes off and goes, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of that's a lot of money. That's a, that's, a, that's a lot of money. It is a lot of money. But no matter how big the number is, God is still God, and His promise is still true. Do I do I believe that? Do do you believe that? Do you believe that if you trust God with your finances, He will take care of you? that he will free you from the anxiety and the fear that you have, and all of the things will be added as well. Second question. Are you also, are you willing to trust God with your finances? Second question. Are you willing to give up the desire for more? Are you willing to give it up? I want more. I want more than what I have. I have this. I have this. They have this. I want that. That's what I want. I'm living a life thinking about and pursuing this desire to have more. That's why I live. That's why I work. That's what I do. So I can have more. And I'm telling you, and Jesus said it in his own very creative way, that desire, that drive for more, well, it'll crush you. It will, it will destroy you from the inside out. Because here's the thing. It can never be satisfied. Ever. How do you ever get more? Well, you get more, and then what? There's more. There's always more. Always. There is no correlation between amount of finances and contentment. There's just not. In fact, the people who have more seem to increase their level of anxiety and fear. But somehow we've convinced ourselves that if I only had more then everything will be fine. He's like, man, Jesus, you've got to be careful with that. You've got to be careful with your eye. You're going to see a lot. And what your heart feels when your eye sees is going to determine your spiritual health. You can either see more and be like, well, good for them. Well, that is nice. But I'm happy with where I am. I'm happy with what I have. Sure, that would be nice, but I don't need that. I'm not even going to worry about it because I am happy here. Can you discipline yourself enough to say that? That I'm just not going to worry about more. I'm going to love today. I'm going to be content today. And whatever tomorrow brings, I'm going to be content with tomorrow. And I'm telling you, we've been married for 25 years. Lots of ups and downs. We've had little, we've had relatively a lot. And it feels like to me, I don't know if this is good theology or not. So we'll just put a parenthesis on the next minute or two, okay? But it seems like God is just kind of has this thing in his head where it's like, this is as prosperous as I want you to be. And um, it's, I would say that, that it's, it's, it's certainly gone up over time. We're more prosperous now than we were when we first got married. But every now and then it seems like, you know, we're managing our finances well, and things are going well, we're in this good spot. It seems like, man, I feel like maybe now we're in a position where maybe we could something. And then, 
bang, two months ago, hot water heater breaks. And I feel like God uses things like that in my mind to be like, hey, you know, you need to just, you need to be content. Stop thinking about what could be and just be okay. And you're like, okay, I think I've learned that lesson. Then you feel real good about it. And then you turn around, you get a bill for 15 times that on a house you don't even want. What did it cost? What is it costing me? Again, I'm not asking you to think about the dollar. Some of you right now, the nerds amongst you are trying to figure out the cost of a have a hot water heater installed and multiply it times 15. Which, um, what is it costing me? What does it cost me? It is keeping me from having more. That's what it's doing. Now, now we don't get to have more. Is that, is that okay? And our youngest, I mean, we're going to be 62 when she graduates college. We weren't ever going to retire anyway. <laughs> I mean, seriously, what is this costing me? It is a significant amount of money. It is not an insignificant amount of money. It is a significant amount of money. But what is it costing me? It is costing us the ability to have more. And I have to decide if the loss of the ability to have something more is significant enough where I'm going to lose faith and trust in who God is and that following His plan and His desires for my life I no longer hold. So there's something we wish we could do that we're not going to be able to do. God, God's still God. His promises still hold. And in a thousand years, I'm not even going to remember that stupid house. I'll still own it. <laughs> but I won't care anymore. I'm sorry, I should, have, I should have only said that in the service my wife wasn't at. That was... <laughs> It's not good for her. So am I willing to trust God with my finances? Am I willing to give up the desire for more? And finally this, are you willing to make a plan and keep it? Are you willing to work a plan and keep it? I, I'm not trying, here's the thing, when I, when I tell stories about myself, I always feel like, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to be like, blah, 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 or foundation issues, and then you're going to feel sorry for me. I'm not trying to make anybody feel sorry for me. And what I'm about to say next now, I'm not trying to make you think that I'm awesome. I'm just, I'm just talking. One of the main reasons why this is not going to be as big a deal for us as it could be is because for 25 years we've been incredibly savvy with our money. We have lived for 25 years firmly committed to the plan that God has told all of us we need to follow with our finances. We give first and foremost out of what we have, we give it to God. We give above and beyond the normal 10% because that's what God has asked us to do, to be generous, not just to give God what is owed Him, but to give more than that, which is what we do. And then we save diligently. We save for things that were planning to happen. We knew all along that there was going to be one year we had two kids in college. We planned for that. We did not plan for the things that have happened over the last couple of months, but we have saved for that. We, have, we, we were prepared because we give, we save, and we don't spend money that we don't have. And that has worked for us when things have been good. It has worked for us when things are bad. Because ultimately, our trust is in God. I trust in God, and if I follow His principles, all of these things will be added as well. It's not that it doesn't cost us anything. It's really disappointing. It's actually pretty frustrating. But God is still God. He's still going to provide. And the only thing I've lost is the potential for more. What's that thing? That'll, that'll kill you anyway. So, can, are you willing to do that? I'm going to make it, I'm just going to, I'm just going to decide. God is in control. I'm going to kill the desire for more. And I'm going to live according to the very simple principles. I'm going to give to God first. 
I'm going to save, and then I'm going to not spend money I don't have. And I don't care what rut you're in right now, God will get you out of it by living according to those simple principles if we also trust and seek Him first. So we put these three questions out there. Can I trust God? Can I kill this desire for more? And am I willing to to make and follow a plan? It's easy to follow a plan when things are good. But when the foundation people come, do you quit giving? No. Because it was living according to those principles that allowed us to be in a situation where we could be where we are anyway. And so I'm going to stick to that plan. The plan isn't when things are good. The plan is for all times. And I'm going to stick to it. But some of those three questions, one of them, two of them, all of them, at one point you bailed. At one point you're like, nah, not not that though. I I, I cannot give up this drive for more. I I, I can't follow those principles. You don't understand. Ah, Trust God, man, that's just stuff Christians say to make themselves feel better. It's really completely up to you. So if you said you'd no to any of those, your time of response, man, is really just an opportunity for you to pray yes into your life. Let's just make a commitment that that's what we'll all do. Let's pray yes into everyone else's life. So we can do that as we worship. We can do that in the back. There's people that love to be praying with you. There have been people praying for you all morning. Since long before you got here, there have been people praying for the service, praying for you. They would love to pray with you right now if you need some help. There's prayer candles. There's communion. There's a cross. There's lots of different ways to respond in prayer. We also have an opportunity to give. And for some of you, that's going to be a great first step, like right now, even before you make the plan. You don't know what the big picture plan is yet. It's going to take a minute. But as a statement, you need to say, I don't know what the big plan is, but I know I need, I need to start here. As, as, as an offering, as a commitment, as a pledge to doing something different than what you're doing right now. But let's be praying. Let's ask God to help us trust, to give up greed, and to make and trust His plan. Let's pray. God, I thank you for these awesome words from Jesus. God, I thank you that that, that He can say something thousands of years ago. And God, they, they ring as true today as they did then. And God, I pray that uh, spiritually, personally, emotionally, physically, God, we'd be able to live according to these principles. God, that we truly would seek you first. God, that you would, um, God, that you would kill greed and desire in us. God, fill us with contentment. And God, help us really live out and work the plan. Give us the courage, God. And again, we thank you for those words from your son. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.